All right. Well, good morning. Good morning to the lobby. I think they can probably hear us. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Good morning, lobby. We would love to see you and your coffee. All right. Well, it is one of my favorite Sundays. Does anybody know why? What? It's the fifth Sunday, so it's one of my favorites. Does anybody know why? The kids are with us. It's Family Sunday. <laughs> Representing a little more strongly than last service, I will say. So I'm yeah, <laughs> very optimistic here. All right, well, will you stand up with us as we get ready to sing this morning? <laughs> All right. Father, we just thank you for blessing us this morning with the opportunity to be here, just to, um, God, to celebrate you, to celebrate the work that you are doing now, the work that, that you have been doing all throughout human history of, of redeeming your people and calling us to your table, calling us to yourself, Lord. And um, God, as we, as we sing your praises, I just, I pray that you will, um, Lord, will you just drive it home into our hearts and into our minds, the goodness of who you are, Lord, and just the amazing love, the amazing mercy, the amazing grace that, that you have given to your people, Lord, that, um, Lord, where once we were not your people, now we are your people. And Lord, I just pray that, that our hearts are filled with praise. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's some good news. You ready? Behold, good news at the prophet. We have some really wonderful young men joining us. Uh, you might say that we are trying to hold on to our youth and uh, celebrate this family Sunday. So we'll see. They bring our age average down, and I, I guess we like that. So, um, so who was here last month for VBS or involved in any way? Show of hands. Oh, come on. Get your hands up there. I see it. I see it. Come on. Yeah, so 
Uh, there were some sayings, and I'm going to say one, and I want to see if you remember what to do. So, God loves you no matter what. Awesome God. Yes, very good. God is with you everywhere. Awesome God. All right, is everybody catching on now? God is in charge. Awesome God. God is stronger than anything. Awesome God. Now, this is your last chance. Get on the boat, okay? God is surprising. Awesome, awesome God. God. Yes, yes, yes. So the next two songs are ones that we did uh, during VBS. And so kids, I know you know them, so I want to hear it, okay? Man. All right, kids, you just move or something. Okay. I want to hear it, okay? Okay, okay. I'm going to hear from Gordon at least, so we'll see. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He Rains from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Let's just lift up our voices. And our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome
Let's just sing that uh, he is the name above all names one more time just our voices he's the name above all names he is worthy of all praise and my heart will sing how great is our God Amen, amen, and all of God's people said, amen. Normally I would come up and just kind of bless our celebration of song and just pray that God would continue, but I actually wanted to come up and speak and then pray um, our, as our worship team leads. Thank you guys. Uh, some were uniformed, some were not, um, but that's good. Those were, as, as Tony already referenced, those were our high school guys along with Miss Sarah. Uh, who went to Kentucky, so uh, we may have a trip planned for Kentucky all over again um, with what's going on there. Our prayers are with those who are suffering in Missouri and in Kentucky. Um, but that's really why I'm coming up the way that I am, and as opposed to praying right out of the gate. Um, we try and do corporate prayer together periodically uh, on at least a monthly basis, um, and today would not necessarily be one of those, but I want to take a few moments and have some extended prayer um, I'm coming up to you with a lot of uh, kind of bounce in my personal step. I'm coming off of yesterday. Some of you were there. Um, we had a men's breakfast, particularly a father-son emphasis to our men's breakfast, although there were there men there who were not necessarily with fathers or sons, and we're glad that everyone was there. But it was really, that was a, that was a real um, lift to my spirits. So I'm coming to you off of that. We had a great time. We played some croquet on the lawn, if you can imagine, uh, and it was really a lot of fun. I, I count those kind of weekends as real highlights. And then I'm coming to you today um, equally excited just by being together as a family. I love seeing all of you and your faces and, and being with you today in fellowship, and the music only got us going in full uh, expression of joy and excitement of being together. However, having said that, I also know there are competing things with that sense of joy and expectation. Uh, let me give you some, just because I, I, here's kind of a hybrid, a celebration and a prayer. Uh, we have with us John and Lynn O'Connor. We're so excited that John and Lynn, you can give them a round of applause. Some of you don't know John and Lynn. They were with us years in the past. What, what year did you move to Florida, 18? Three years, 2019 maybe. Yeah, they're old. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, no, but John and Lynn were part of our family. Lynn has battled health for a long time and is up here getting some much-needed uh, treatment and some, some visiting with the doctors, and that's really what I want to pray. I'm glad that they, the O'Connors are with us, but praying for Lynn and her health. Here's a few others. Last night, got news that Brian Tussing took a very bad bicycle fall uh, and is at Meredith right now. Uh, broke some bones, uh, deflated lung. I mean, so not a small deal whatsoever. Joe Mar is with Brian right now. Um, Beth Clip is in um, some struggling health. This coming Friday, Gina Poffenberger, we've kept you informed about Gina. She goes in for some, uh, her procedure to begin for cancer treatment. 
That's this Friday. Then it was reminded to me earlier this morning about Charlie Norris. I don't think any of our Norris family members are here, are they? But little Charlie Norris had an appendicitis um, a burst, a young little girl, and, and not young little girl as much anymore. She's growing, but uh, so she, the doctors are addressing that for, uh, and Pat and Laura are, are her, her folks, and they're dealing with that. Obviously, I mentioned the floods um, in the center part of our country, uh, our world, our country, all sorts of things. And so it just felt like with some of these personal, I just spoke with Miss Judy this morning and Richard Munch, our dear friend Richard, is struggling. And so there's so much of that. I know I didn't even touch on some of them that might be in your, in your world and what you're dealing with. But if you would allow me to just kind of open us up in a time of a few extended moments of prayer for these people in these situations, I would really appreciate that. Would you join me for just a moment? Father God, I am excited about this morning. I truly am. I'm, I'm so delighted to be with my family, my church family. I'm, obviously, I have my uh, nuclear family, but I'm, I'm so excited that that family extends into very meaningful relationships right here in this room and, and in this building, in the, in the children's rooms and servants uh, working for our kids and for us. And just all of these things, Lord, I love being here on a Sunday morning, and I thank you. Thank you for our worship team and how they set us up so well. Uh, awesome God, you are. And so we thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for what happened yesterday with our men, a good showing of our men and some of, some of those younger men, those boys coming out and just having a great morning together, eating a good meal and, and laughing and sharing stories and playing a little croquet on the lawn. Lord, all of that is just a delight in my life, and I thank you. So this weekend, I feel that, that uh, spring in my own step to be here this morning. But at the same time, Lord, I know that you've given me a task and all of us a task to bear with one another in our burdens. And, and so, Lord, I pray for these individuals. We do celebrate that, that Lynn and John are with us, and we pray over her and her body and the doctors who are addressing just old, years-long struggles of health. Pray, God, that you, thank you for what relief you have given her and pray for more still to come. Uh, Lord, I pray for Brian at the hospital this morning. Uh, Lord, would you be comforting him and, and healing his body after a, a very, very terrible little crash on his bike and, um, and asking God for you to heal that body? Uh, Lord, I think of our, our young at heart. We have spoke of, of Richard, Lord. We think of uh, even... Gina Poffenberger and, and her procedure that is coming up here very soon. I think of Beth Clip um, and what she is dealing with. And then on the other side of the spectrum, even someone like little Charlie and dealing with an unexpected diagnosis of appendicitis and, and the doctors making sure, hoping, praying that, that they can address and, and get her back on her feet um, very quickly. Lord, we pray for Pat and Laura as they minister to their own daughter. Uh, through a very difficult spell. I know this only is a, a small representation, Lord, of others that I could speak to. I'm sure there are things going on in, in people's lives that, that I haven't even spoken to. We pray for an unspoken, your spirit, just to minister to the others that have not been verbally mentioned, but we know are happening in our church family. Um, Lord, then we extend outward. I think of the, the folks in Kentucky. Our students went to one place in Kentucky this summer and and there's a whole other area of that state and a few other states surrounding that are dealing with loss of life, um, the flooding, the, the tragedy that that is. Uh, Lord, it does feel, we, we do, we feel it. Maybe it's just as we get older, we feel them more pronounced. But where we are dealing with a sense of brokenness all around us, our country, Lord, we pray for it. We pray for a sense of um, purpose and, and uh, identity within our country. Uh, and then, Lord, for the world around us, the war in Ukraine and, and so many other issues, Lord. Uh, it is only, it, it, these types of things cause us to say, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We are wearied. And yet, like Paul says, but I remain back for your good. And so, Lord, may we remain back with each other for each other's good. And we'll see so much of that even today in our message. But, God, we thank you. We thank you for gathering us together. What a beautiful gathering of people you've brought together, both the first and now this second hour of our time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that. Uh, my name, if you don't know me, if you're a guest with us, I'm Gordon McDaniel. I serve as the pastor here at Faith Christian Fellowship. I want to thank uh, Lynn and Pastor Dave from the last two Sundays. I was 
I was gone part of those time, part of that time. I was back last Sunday, but Pastor Dave uh, gave me the chance to have a restful Sunday being back. Um, but I want to thank them. I'm, I'm so excited to be back in this role that I'm playing. So I, I serve as the pastor. If you're a guest with us, you want to find somebody that has maybe one of these name tags if you're visiting with us. Uh, there's a few that are floating around. We would love to engage and have conversation with you and make sure that we have met whatever needs that you have this morning. Uh, so please find someone, either myself or someone wearing one of those name tags. We want to make sure that you do not go away uh, in any way not having been connected to this morning. If you got your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. I also add my thanks to the kids who are with us. We're excited to have our, our young people on a family worship Sunday. So um, that's also a neat part of today. We're in Philippians chapter 2. Our sermon series is entitled The Joy of Fellowship, right out of this great letter of Philippians. You can't really read Philippians and not walk away, this is my personal opinion, and not walk away encouraged by the relationship that Paul has with the Philippian church. It is a beautiful love story to each other. Their sense of unity, their sense of warmth, their sense of love that they have for each other in their ministry, in their work of the ministry of the gospel. And among almost any letter that you could possibly read, Philippians stands out as that, that overwhelming sense of, um, of joy together. Being in this together, the commendation that Paul has of these great saints of the faith, and he talks so highly of them and so in such celebration of his relationship to them, uh, and you, you just can't come away from it. So we have been walking our way, working our way through it, and we are today in Philippians chapter, four, or chapter 2, verses 14 to 30. If you are able to, I invite you to stand with me in honor of the Word of God as I read it aloud. You along with me silently if you uh, either have your copy of the Word or listening to it as I read it aloud. From the New American Standard Bible this morning, Philippians 2, beginning in verse 14 to the end of the chapter. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And if, and I trust, excuse me, in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not, only, not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with joy, with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Please be seated. Pastor Dave, among other things, said something very potent, very, um, very significant from last week's message. 
recognizing that we try and break up the text of Scripture into smaller chunks so that we can explore it a little more deeply as we go along. Pastor Dave mentioned something last week, and he spoke it to me as he was preparing for last week's message. It's hard in the case of a letter like Philippians to jump in somewhere sort of arbitrarily chosen because it is such a continuation of thought nearly from beginning to end. And for him and and for Lynn prior to him the week before, and for me even before that, there is this sort of singular message that is playing out uh, with Paul's writing to the Philippians, beginning all the way back in chapter 1 and now seeing it through the end of chapter 2, this continuous thought of the joy of unity through our humility of each, towards each other. And now what we're going to look at today is an expression of the lack of that humility in the practice of complaining and grumbling. Now it's not my typical manner to try and step on toes as the expression goes or to punch anyone in the nose okay to rhyme it out kids did you like that yeah that was good thank you um to do any of that that's not my normal disposition and it really isn't even that today and yet as i look at these verses that we're going to look at together i can't deny that all of us may walk out a little bloodied because we're talking about something that there is probably no one in this room who is, that is immune to. And that is the practice of grumbling and complaining. All of us, I would presume, I know I feel this way, need a lot of introspection. It's like Psalm 139, right? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. The idea that we are going to look at is not, is, it's not like we have, again, going back to Pastor Dave's message last week, it's not like we are changing the topic. It is a continuation of what has been going now for several weeks of our time all the way from chapter 1 into chapter 2. And it's the idea of humility and its proper place and proper expression or its contrast and that being of grumbling and complaining. Did you ever imagine that your grumbling and complaining would do harm like what Paul is going to describe? I want you to think about that. Your grumbling and complaining, my grumbling and complaining, would do the harm that Paul describes it doing in this section right here. Let's look at it. Grumbling, complaining, and grumbling, verses 14 to 18. Do all things, all things, without grumbling and disputing all things there is literally that that fills the room up doesn't it it just opens up and it says everything that you can bring to the subject to the conversation everything that you could talk about do all things without grumbling or disputing we're going to apply or think of it in very practical ways but that's where paul begins or again it's not really his beginning this is how he continues so much of philippians is a is a joyful expression of a letter but that does not mean that there is no room for paul to exhort he loves them dearly he's writing to them from a prison right in rome i shared with you a couple weeks ago historically speaking paul was in prison in philippi acts chapter 16 the jailer that was holding paul came to faith His household came to faith. There was a church that was birthed in this place of Philippi. Now Paul is gone. Now he's in Rome, and he's in his first of two imprisonments in Rome. He will get out, historically speaking. He will minister, as he describes. I hope to go. I hope to be with you again soon. And there's a good chance that he was. And then he will have a second future Roman imprisonment where he will give his life. This is his first, and so he's writing to them, and he's like, don't do anything with grumbling and disputing, right? Don't do any of it so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach. Hear all of those descriptors as a contrast to grumbling and complaining. That you would prove yourselves blameless. As Paul's saying that we would literally be without sin, 
No, that reputationally, people would know that when I sin, I own it. When I claim it, when, when, I, when sin is exposed to me, I own it in my life. And when sin is seen in somebody else, I am merciful and compassionate to the sin in theirs. You will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach. All of that is rooted in the idea that we would not grumble and complain. Did you ever imagine that such practice that we do probably every day, if you're like me, all of us, struggle with that, that habit of grumbling, that habit of complaining about whatever in our life and towards each other? Did you ever imagine the cost that it was? The cost that that, that plays out. Blameless and innocent children of God above reproach. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, how do you ever expect to be different from this generation? Crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. This is all of what grumbling and complaining does. These are all of the ways in which it breaks us down. We no longer can sort of take that position which God offers us of a sense of blamelessness and innocence, a child of his, above reproach, different from our perverse generation around us, and lights in the world. That's costly, isn't it? It ought to make us think a little bit about our spirit of grumbling and complaining. It doesn't end there. Holding fast the word of life, hear this, so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory. Because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. If the reasons for abstaining from our spirit of grumbling, our spirit of argument, our spirit of contention, if, if it wasn't enough that, that we, we desire to be light in the world, that's what we are, and, and we're a contrast to a perverse and crooked generation if that wasn't enough paul is pleading with them he's like please don't let me have run and toiled in vain are you serious because we got a little bit chippy with each other paul we've emptied your ministry yeah yeah absolutely you please don't do that verse 17 says but even if i listen if i am poured out as a drink offering Upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Look, I will go through, I will go through anything if you understand this. I am not afraid of any of it. And my toiling and my running will not be in vain. But that is contrasted very specifically with a sense of grumbling and complaining. And he says, you, you too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Reciprocating, back and forth. Tell you what, let's give up the grumbling and complaining and fill my joy up. Remember what he says back in early part of chapter 2? If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship in the Spirit, any affection or compassion, make my joy complete. By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do you hear it? This is, this is how chapter 2, even further back in chapter 1, it is one, I totally agree with Pastor Dave, it is one continuous thought, all related to the same subject. I provided a, a bit of a a little diagram that I think helps us understand really all the way from chapter 1 into chapter 2. It's very much this message, I think. A, pursue humility. Make that part of your, your striving is a humble heart. Pursue humility. We'll look at it again in a minute, but verses 3 and 4, right? Do, you know, don't do anything out of selfish or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, consider, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. 
right? So we pursue humility. As a result of pursuing humility, we enjoy unity together. And as we enjoy that unity, we are called then in that unified place, in that sense of unity, we are called to then combat arguing with one another. It's very interesting that Pastor Dave spent a lot of time in verses 12 and 13, right? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And he was, I totally agree with him. He's right to say that that salvation is not not heaven and hell. It's not eternal salvation. It's the process of, of, of us being saved being perfected into the image of Christ, our sanctification. Work out your, your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, what is, then, then he gives us a very tangible, practical, that's really deep theology. For it is God who is at work in you, both to do his will and his work for his good pleasure, right? Verse 13, so, so this is deep theology, and where does he go next? Do all things without grumbling and disputing. I literally think that Paul is saying to them, here is a beautiful way to work out your salvation. Here is one of the most basic, tangible, every day, all of us struggle. Here's a place to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. He says, you are lights in a world that is perverse and crooked. And what will tear that down? Grumbling and complaining. I think in the case of being lights, right? In chapter 5 of Matthew, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. uh, My kids have the salt light, right? T-shirts. Matthew 5, 13 to 16. I'm reading for you just 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone, hear hear this particularly, verse 15, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it, uh, excuse me, and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are, what Paul is describing in Philippians chapter 2 is really the principle of lighting a lamp and putting it under a basket. Grumbling and complaining. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, right? If I placed you in the world as lights, you will be lights. Here are ways where you have forfeited your role as lights. Grumbling and complaining. And then I think, again, continuing, that it's not really a new subject, but rather a continuation is that he highlights two bright lights in a perverse world. The two bright lights that he goes on to highlight for us in the latter part of the chapter are that, is that of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now most of you probably in this room know Timothy. Epaphroditus is a little bit more of an obscure character, but I can't wait to meet Epaphroditus one day. Timothy and Epaphroditus. Let me in general just share with you, kind of summarize in a little bit of what this section describes. You know, usually when Paul describes in letters those who have labored with him, he oftentimes does it at the conclusion of his letters. He's sort of giving thanks and, and, and commendation and, and um, a reference to those who have ministered alongside of him. But this, is, this goes to that continuation of the thought that he began in chapter 1 and carried through chapter 2. And now into this, being lights in the world, I think he wants us to see, I think he wanted them to see, and he wants us to see, that Timothy and Epaphroditus are the contrast to grumbling and complaining. They are bright lights in a perverse world. Timothy, uh, their distinguishing qualities, Timothy is Paul's messenger to the Philippians. Epaphroditus is actually the Philippians' missionary to Paul. That it, it, it's as though Timothy, who was always very closely linked to Paul, in fact, Paul calls him a child of, his, of him as a father. Like a child of a father, Timothy labored with me, did exactly what we needed to be done. So Timothy is oftentimes linked very closely with Paul, but in this case, Epaphroditus is the Philippians' messenger or missionary back to him. Now, in Epaphroditus' case, specifically, Paul is going to say, I'm sending him back to you. I want you to be encouraged because I know you heard. And he knew 
that you heard that he was sick even to the point of death. I want to send him to you so that you would be encouraged. But let's look at each one separately. First, let's start with Timothy, the well-known Timothy. We have two letters that Paul wrote to Timothy. They're not Timothy's letters. Timothy is the recipient, but we learn a lot about Timothy from having even two letters written to him by Paul. So he's a little bit more familiar to us, but I want, to hear, I want you to hear the way that Paul describes Timothy in this particular chapter. Verse 19, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I may be encouraged when I hear of your condition. Paul's intent was to say, Timothy, you are my eyes and ears. I'm going to send you. I can't go. He's in prison. So Timothy at his right side, right? I'm going to send you and you are going to be my eyes and ears. And I can't wait to have you back. Go and come that I might be encouraged at what's happening in Philippi. He says, I I want to be encouraged, for I have no one else, hear this, no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. It's as though when you see, Paul is saying basically, when you see Timothy, you see me. There is no distinction. There's no one like him. We are of such kindred spirit, he and I, right? Right? For they all seek, talking about all others who serve, they all seek their own interests, but not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child. There it is. We had our men's breakfast with some of our young boys coming out, right? And we talked about this very thing, Um, that he was the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me, and I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. He's sending Timothy, and he calls him one of kindred spirit who is completely, genuinely concerned for the Philippians themselves, and contrast that with those who seek their own personal interests. He's saying, Timothy, what does that sound like? Remember, we just read out of chapter 2. Look again if you need to. Back up at verse 3. Chapter 3, do nothing out of selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, consider, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This This is one thought that Paul just continually refers back to, and he ties Timothy to that early in the chapter 2 kind of person. He's not out for his own interests, he's out for you. He cares about you. And then we see Epaphroditus, beginning in verse 25. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Hear how he describes Epaphroditus. My brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier. A soldier, one who is willing, and we'll see how, but willing to lay his life down for the singular purpose that we are all about. Paul says. He's my brother, he's a worker, he's a soldier. He even calls him this, and this is really interesting to me, I found this very fascinating. He essentially calls Epaphroditus a priest of Philippi. A priest. In verse 25, continuing on, a fellow soldier, and then he says, who was also your messenger and minister to my need. The word that we get minister from is a word that means priestly duties. Basically, Paul is calling Epaphroditus a Philippian priest. To me, he is your, he's your advocate. He is your mediator. He is the one that came and even describes me, says what, what you were deficient in doing, meaning just simply you were not able to do in presence, Epaphroditus did. And it nearly cost him his life. It nearly took his life, risking, he says, risking his life for both Paul and on behalf of the Philippians. You know, we talk about life and death. We talk about if our our family members, our friends, people who have gone on, who have passed on but know the Lord Jesus, we're in this place of both grief and celebration. Paul is, is showing us every bit of his humanity. He says, The Lord was merciful not only to Epaphroditus when he was sick, he was merciful to me that I would not be multiplied in my sorrow. 
and Epaphroditus that he was on his deathbed. And God restored him to good health. And, and knowing full well, both Epaphroditus and Paul knew that the discouragement in the Philippians was, will we ever see Epaphroditus again? They heard of his sickness. They were distressed at his sickness. And he says, I can't wait to send him back to you that you might be lifted. Imagine the hugging of the necks when Epaphroditus showed up in Philippi. What it would have looked like, how it would have encouraged them what it would have done for them. I was sharing last hour that, you know, in some ways I almost wish that Dave was teaching this passage because he lives this. This is why we have Dave with us, and we're so excited. And, and we've been able to do less of it, but maybe more in time to come. But we, Dave, Pastor Dave is our Epaphroditus. He's our Epaphroditus to, uh, to Nicaragua, to to Yodder and to the, the pastors in the Bible Institute. He's our Epaphroditus to Pastor Guillermo, where they just went this past week with a team, not just, not just David himself, but others with him. He's our Epaphroditus to uh, Pastor Luke in Haiti. He's our Epaphroditus to the Paranos in Ecuador. He's our Epaphroditus to Bishop Silas in Uganda. He's our Epaphroditus in the Far, in the far East. This is why this is so enjoyable to think. And there have been times, and we sort of chuckled, but also quite seriously, there have been times, and I've been on these trips. I never, I can tell you, I want you to go on a trip, but I'm going to give you something that may make you say, do you really want me to go? I almost never come back healthy. (laughs) Isn't that great? I never do. I'm as sick as a dog when I come back from a mission trip. There are times when, on the mission trip, Dave has shared stories about him. He's been in the hospital in Nicaragua. I don't know if I'm going to make it back. Now, by God's grace, he did, of course. And that's what we see here in Epaphroditus. We see, and, and when you know what it takes to go over, and you know what it takes to come back, and you know that it is not easy, you, you realize how special people like Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, Paul doesn't say this, but we have, the, we have the implication that on his deathbed, Epaphroditus was not a big complainer, right? That's sort of the picture. I'm, I'm filling in sort of what is unsaid, but seems to be in contrast to this idea of do everything, do, uh, do all things without grumbling or complaining. And he uses Timothy, and even more so Epaphroditus, as the contrast. That it didn't even, I I, I imagine Epaphroditus being on his deathbed saying, the Lord's will be done. I'm here. This is what you intended for me. And Paul's over there weeping. Please, dear God, do not let him go. For my my sorrow will be multiplied. But Epaphroditus, God, this is your lot for me. I will accept whatever your hand brings. That's the picture. Again, unsaid but the picture that we are being painted by Paul in Philippians 2. I turn to the idea of a very familiar Old Testament example. Not exactly the same, but allow me, if you would, just a moment of connection. There's a story maybe many of you know in a place called Kadesh Barnea. Numbers chapter 13 and 14. What is that? That's the, and as I describe it, it's going to come to you quickly. It's the time where 12 were chosen to go and spy the land out of the wilderness, the promised land. There are so many similarities, I think, and I don't believe Paul was trying to make this parallel. I'm the one doing it for the moment. But there are a lot of similarities, actually, between the story of the spies going and spying out the land in, in Canaan, in Kadesh Barnea, going and seeing that, Right And what we are reading here in Philippians chapter 2. Let me give you some examples, a little lesson from them. They, twelve were chosen, one for, you know, twelve men were chosen, one from each tribe of each of the tribes of Israel in the wilderness. I want you to go and see what God has promised for us. And they go and they find things like they've never seen. Grapes, a bunch of grapes that can only be carried on the stick between two men's shoulders. A land flowing with milk and honey. But what else did they find? Giants. The descendants of the Nephilim. That they came back and said, 
There is no way that we can be victorious coming into this land. Ten of them said such things. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 2, listen to what they specifically say. All the sons of Israel did what? They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, listen to this, what or would that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would that we had died in this wilderness? You want to take us into a place where we're going to get slaughtered? Just leave me in Egypt. Just leave me in the wilderness if you're going to do that. Why bother? Here's some similarities that I see between the story of Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 13 and 14 and that of Philippians chapter 2. There's a sense of oneness. God had made for himself one people. And he had chosen, Moses had chosen 12, one from every tribe to go. I want us all to be represented in this this endeavor. Everyone, every tribe is going to have a set of eyes and a set of ears. Just like Timothy, I'm going to send a representative. And he's going to be an expression of our oneness. These 12 spies, they're going to be, we are one. Second, salvation. Look at how it's described. Would that we have died in the land of Egypt. But you didn't. You didn't die in the land of Egypt. God brought you out in an amazing way. And he fed you. And he was with you the whole time. And our salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who though, although he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Our salvation. I think of this so much of the two lights. The two lights, what were they? But Joshua and Caleb would not be, their light would not be dimmed in a perverse and crooked group of men. Their light would not be dimmed. And what do we find in Philippians 2? We find Timothy and Epaphroditus, their light would not be dimmed. But then the most obvious parallel is that of grumbling and complaining. We see all the good, God, that comes from this, but it just isn't enough. There's a piece of it that is still out there for me to grumble and complain about. It's not perfect. (laughs) It's not Gordon airtight. God, if you just get on board with my idea, I wouldn't grumble. I wouldn't complain about it. And so I close with these four questions. First, and I, I mean this to be out of love. Are you a grumbler? Even if only to yourself. In the case of... Numbers 14, at first, in verse 2, we read it, we looked at it. He says it grumbled against Moses and Aaron. But further down in chapter 14, I think it's verse 27, you know what it says? God is speaking, and he says, you grumbled against me. You grumbled to me. You, You can't claim you grumbled to Moses and Aaron. That's what you did outwardly. What did you do really? You grumbled to me. And that's what God had said to Moses all along. Moses, don't worry about it. I know they hate you. (laughs) I know they despise you, Moses. It's really not you. It's me. And that's what he's saying in Numbers 14. I know they grumbled against you, Moses. Aaron, I know they grumbled against you. I want you to know this. They are grumbling against me. And so my question to us is, are you a grumbler? Even if only to yourself. It's a... Think of all of the things that grumbling and complaining dilutes, empties, our blameless, innocent children of God, right? Lights in a crooked generation, above reproach, not not spoiling Paul's or anyone prior to us. You know, I share with you a a handful of names from several weeks ago. Lewis Drum, Ken McGrath, right? Anna Sturm. I named off names that were my Paul's. Right? What I want to say to Lewis or Anna or Ken or Floyd Clark, what I want to say, ah, 
yeah, you kind of toiled in vain in my case. I'm kind of a grumbler. I don't really like the way that God does these things, even if to yourself. This is, again, Psalm 139, right? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. Secondly, if we are truly single-minded for the gospel, which I'm sure everyone in here would say, I hope to be, I hope we are, I hope that's what we're doing. If we are single-minded for the gospel, can you tell me how many disputes rise up to that kind of purposefulness? What is worthy to be grumbled about in contrast to the single-minded effort of advancing the gospel forward? Yes, I know, that, they, and I've always struggled. I don't know what to do with Acts chapter 15 when Paul and Barnabas say to each other, we can't work together. John Mark just raises too many questions for each of us. One, hoping to restore him. One, not ready to take that risk. And so they part ways. And yes, I also know that the gospel was multiplied because two different teams, Barnabas and John Mark, go out in one direction and Paul and Silas go out in another. All of that is true, and yet I would confess to you that it's the one place, and whenever we talk about, hey, I have reason to grumble, somebody is doing this, or or, this isn't quite right, we always go to Acts 15, myself included. Well, there are times, you know, I mean, let's be honest, there's that once where Paul and Barnabas just couldn't do it. We just can't make it happen. Can we just take that one that none of us can fully understand and just say, does that really rise up to the gospel, our single-mindedness being for the gospel? Is that reason for me to gripe about what kind of music, what kind of, uh, who is up speaking, what what kind of testimony is shared if it's gospel-minded? I mean, all of the different things that we could get gripey about is my point. Does it rise to gospel advancing? Third, can grumbling and humility come? This one hurts. All right? All of our nose. Just hold them up. Pinch them. I don't know how you do it anymore. I'm not sure. Can grumbling and humility come from the same person? Jesus said trees can't produce different fruit. James says a spring cannot produce fresh and spoiled water, bitter water. And so I just simply ask a similar question. Can grumbling and humility come at the same time in the same person? It's pretty potent to us. And third and fourthly, excuse me, in a perverse world which we live. That's the reality. Not more or less. I'm not even trying to rate it. I'm only saying that we live in a crooked and perverse world. How can we, listen, work out our salvation, verse 12, and be lights in the world, verse 15, while pursuing our own interests? I realize that these four questions, they overlap, they touch, they bump into each other. I'm leaving for them, leaving them for you, excuse me, to search, God, search my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. I don't have any one of you pegged for these struggling questions. If anything, I have only myself to reflect on in a personal manner. But I'm leaving them out there for you. To ask, to the extent that grumbling and complaining is a place of struggle, a place of common habit, for us to look at one another, to look at God, to grumble against Him, to grumble against that that we find, as Clark often likes to say from, I believe, Watchman Nee, grumble at the ways that find fault with the ways of God. Right? So true. Have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. See, you you see how all of this is so connected. Dave was exactly right. This is not a new thought. This is just us, this is Paul telling us over and over again what it looks like to be of humble heart, to be lights, to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach, Making the work and the running of those who have gone before us worthwhile. Have you ever imagined that your attitude of, of dispute 
your attitude of frustration that it's not the way you like it at every turn empties what is so good that God is doing among us. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you. Thank you that you are so patient with me. You have showed me for over 50 years patience like I do not deserve. Even as your own son, as your adopted son through the Lord Jesus, I continually find fault with your ways. I continually find, try and tell you the better way it could be done. Try and tell my brothers and sisters where they have stepped out. It truly brings to attention the speck in, in the log in my eye and the speck in my brother's eye. Lord, all of these things, it, it, it all starts to make sense. It all, it's like it comes out of the paper on us, and we begin to see it so clearly. Lord, there will be a day tomorrow, there will be time later today that I grumble, that I, am, that I am tempted at least to grumble about something. In all things, do so without grumbling and complaining. And Lord, you will find me struggling, I'm sure, even later this afternoon. Thank you for your patience. But also, Lord, may I not overlook that while you are patient, you are relentless. Relentless to correct what is yet not Christ-like in my life. And I thank you for that. I want to be like Jesus, as I know those of my friends in this room do too. We love you, God, and we thank you for this great day and beautiful day. Bless us as we go, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks, everybody. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. You are dismissed. Thank you, kids. Great to have you this morning.